a whole new world. <clears throat> it, it didn't come out right. That's the sound. Sounded a lot. Sounded a lot better in my head. I'll be honest. My throat's kind. My throat's kind of dry. Throat's kind of dry right now. So you guys understand. Um, okay. This is Bray is about a man and his quest for the perfect photo. He would eventually get it, but it would cost him dearly. We will show you his picture at the end of today's video. But before we get into Did today's he kill story, himself to get a picture? if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if Saturday April exposure, that's what I pay my editors in. April 25th, and my 1987, mods. was a beautiful spring day in the mountains of Northwest Montana. It was exactly the kind of day that 40-year-old Charles Gibbs and his wife Glenda had been waiting for for months. The sky was clear, the sun was bright, and the of breeze you get was paid. warm. And so, at around 9 a.m. that morning, Charles and Glenda had a quick breakfast inside of their house in the rural city of Libby, and then they started stuffing their backpacks full of their hiking equipment. Charles and Glenda were going to go to Glacier National Park, which is a one million acre wilderness preserve with alpine meadows, forests, rivers, and lakes that are so bright and crystal blue, they almost look like they're glowing. The park is ringed by snow-covered mountains, and it's dotted with glaciers, which are huge masses of pure ice that jut up out of the rock and make you feel like you've stumbled onto some ancient frozen planet. The park is actually so otherworldly that when Hollywood producers were looking for a location to shoot the heaven scene in the big movie What Dreams May Come, they chose Glacier National Park as their location. And for Charles and Glenda, this place practically was heaven. It was the place they went all the time to go hiking, especially on beautiful sunny spring days. After packing all of their gear, Charles and Glenda made their way out the front door and began heading to their car, when as they were walking, Charles suddenly stopped short, shook his head, turned Let around, me guess. and it's ran not back gonna be the house. <laughs> when he came <laughs> Dude, that would be that would have been a perfect Resident Evil Leon line right there. And they thought it was heaven, but they found out that it that he heaven wasn't so great. It's like one of those movie trailers from the 90s. Two people walk into a forest and they thought it was heaven. And they're going to find out that heaven isn't so e isn't so great. Isn't so heavenly came back out again he was carrying his camera bag and so he ran over to the car he sat down in the driver's seat and he grinned at his wife and he held up the bag and he said now we're ready both charles and glenda worked for the starring adam in sandler Britain. glenda was an elementary school teacher and charles drove a school bus but like a lot of people who lived in montana their real passion was the outdoors and for Charles specifically, his real passion was wildlife photography. He was actually a pretty accomplished amateur photographer. He'd had a couple of photo exhibits locally, and he'd gotten a few of his pictures published in the local newspaper. But what Charles really wanted to do with his photography was get one of his wildlife pictures published in a weekly publication called The Hungry Horse News. The Hungry Horse News was a tiny publication, but they had won a Pulitzer Prize, which is the highest award for American journalism. And The Hungry Horse News was famous for its nature photography. Charles had been submitting his work for years to The Hungry Horse News, but the editor kept rejecting them, telling Charles that his photos were totally beautiful, but they weren't dynamic enough. Nothing was happening in these photos. And so that morning on the couple's drive mm. to Glacier National Park, Charles began- Oh yeah, I'll show you something that happens. Jumps off a cliff, takes a picture of him with his thumbs up, jumping off a cliff, dies. 
Is that what it is? And talking out loud to Glenda about what strategy he was going to use for his photographs during their hike. You know, what route they were going to be on and what was the best God angle damn. to take photo, certain pictures. Photo stuff and was as Glenda listened to Charles, like she just smiled deal. to herself because it was like no matter how many times Charles mm. got shot down by the Hungry Horse News, she knew he was never going to give up. And so she loved his determination he and just because the cameraman always lives about true. his craft. At around 11 a.m., Charles and Glenda pulled off the highway and began heading towards the trailhead where they would start their hike that day, which was located at the base of Elk Mountain on the southern border of the park. The route they had chosen for that day was not one of the most popular at the park, and the reason for that was the trail was really steep, and in certain parts of it, it was fairly overgrown, and so really only the most hardcore hikers would go up this trail, of which there weren't that many. And so Charles and Glenda were used to being on this trail and seeing no one, but they preferred it that way. They loved being alone out in nature. Finally, they reached the gravel parking lot right at the trailhead, and Charles parked their car, and then he and Glenda hopped out, they grabbed their bags, and then began walking on this trail. The first mile of this trail brought the couple out along an abandoned road, and then over some railroad tracks, and then out into this beautiful field full of white flowers, <laughs> and then the trail really started to get difficult because it basically went straight up the side of a mountain. And as they walked up this really steep part of the trail, Charles was nonstop taking pictures of everything he saw. There were deer and mountain goats, and at some point the couple reached a clearing on this steep section where they could look down and see a lake, this and they saw sad. there were beavers hard at work building a dam. Aww. And so of course, Charles got a picture of that too. Beavers. Now, these were the days before digital photography, and so all these pictures that Charles was taking, he couldn't actually see. He needed to go home and develop the film to see if anything he took was worth keeping. But as Charles and Glenda continued their hike up this mountain, Charles was getting more and more excited about some of the shots he was getting. He felt like they were going to be really, really good, and Hungry Horse News was Charles going to finally the accept act the elephant. The couple made it to the oh, summit God. of this trail by early afternoon. I don't want to relive that. From up there, they had this beautiful panoramic view of all these jagged mountaintops that were covered in snow, separated by these huge valleys and prairies, and Charles and Glenda were the only ones up there, and so they had this unbelievable view all to themselves. And so the couple would eat the lunch that they brought with them while sitting on this rocky outcropping, kind of looking out over this stunning view. And then when they were done, they packed up their stuff and began heading back down because they knew they wanted to get off of this trail and out of the park before sundown. It was just about 5 p.m. when Charles and Glenda had reached the final slope of this steep section of the trail, and they were getting closer and closer to that big open field with the white flowers. And as they're going down this last section of steepness, Charles suddenly grabs Glenda and stops her and puts his fingers to his lips and then turns around and points behind him. Charles was visibly excited about whatever he was pointing at, but when- It's a grizzly bear, isn't it? Is he gonna get, is he gonna take a picture, like a selfie, with the grizzly bear chasing after him? Or some shit? Glenda looked in the direction he was pointing, she couldn't see anything, but she <laughs> obviously knew that whatever he was pointing at, Charles wanted to take a picture of it. Now, Glenda, by this point, was really tired from the hiking and just wanted to go back to the car and go home. I mean, after all, Charles had taken dozens and dozens of pictures that day, like we don't need to get one more. And so Glenda would look at Charles impatiently, basically suggesting like, come on, we can come back another time. But Charles didn't budge and he looked at her like, please, I wanna get one more photo. And so Glenda kind of did one of these and was like, okay. And Charles said, thank you, I'll meet you at the car. And so Glenda stood there and watched as her husband got his camera out, turned around, and began slowly making his way back up the trail. And again, Glenda's looking. She can't see what he's going to take a picture of, but she figured, you know, he had his plan. And Glenda, she turned around and began heading back down towards the car. It didn't take long for Glenda to get Babe, back to the car. Babe, let me get a pic of this She got there right around 6 p.m. And when she got there, she hopped inside, sat in the front passenger seat, turned on the radio, and then she expected to have to wait for maybe another 20 minutes or so for Charles to finish up and come join her. 
But Glenda, after sitting in the car, was so tired that she accidentally fell asleep. And when she woke up again, uh -oh. she was kind of disoriented. And immediately she looked to see if her husband was in the car with her, and he wasn't. And she's looking outside, it's getting pretty dark out. She glanced at her watch, it was 7 p.m., which means Charles had left her for at least an hour by this point. And she's thinking, there's no way Charles would have been gone for an hour. He would never do that. He would never leave me alone like that. And so Glenda began glancing around her, kind of half expecting to see Charles just outside of their car, you know, doing something, but she was all alone. There was no other hikers or cars. Charles wasn't there. And so starting to panic, Glenda got out of her car and began hustling back onto the trail to go look for Charles. And so she's yelling for Charles. She's looking around. It's getting darker and darker, and there's no sign of Charles. He's not calling back to her. It's just totally silent. So she walks along the abandoned road. She reaches the railroad tracks. She gets into that that meadow with the white flowers and still there's no sign of Charles and she gets to the base of that steep section of the trail and she's looking up at all these trees and how dark it was getting and she's thinking to herself if Charles is in trouble somewhere up there there's no way I can help him by myself in the dark with no equipment. No one knows I'm here. I mean, this is an emergency and I need help. And so Glenda would scream a few more times for Charles. And after not hearing any response, she turned and ran all the way back to her car. She turned it on. Charles is dead. And she drove to the nearest ranger station. He got bared. That's what I'm assuming. He got bared. Help.com slash hashtag bear selfie. I've also left a link in the description. <clears throat> When she got there, she ran inside and immediately told the ranger where her and Charles had been, which trail they were on. Please tell me the where... Hunger Horse published one of these photos, at least. Imagine he went through all that and then the publishing company's like, nah, not good enough, sorry. Roughly they were on this trail when she had gone to the car and Charles had turned around and gone uphill to take a picture of something. And as Glenda told the ranger all these details about where they were inside of the park, he really started to look Too worried. Blurry. And when Glenda was done explaining, he told her that, yes, we need to go right now and look for your husband, but I can't have you on that trail. It's too dangerous. And so this ranger had Glenda wait at the ranger station and the ranger by himself headed back to the trailhead to go looking for Charles. And so the ranger, he gets to the trailhead, he hops out, he's got a rifle and a flashlight, and he begins walking along this trail. And by now, it's dark out. And so he's looking straight ahead yeah, with his flashlight that, and scanning side to side. He's calling out for Charles, and he's walking this trail. He gets all the way across the train tracks, through the meadow, and he gets to the steep section, and he actually begins going up this part of the trail until roughly the area where Glenda had described Charles going one way and her going back down. And when he he got there there was no sign of charles and so the ranger just took his rifle and fired three shots into the air hoping that that might get charles if he was in the area to hear him and call out or do something to indicate where he had gone but after firing his gun the ranger heard nothing by this point it was approaching midnight it was totally pitch black outside and the ranger knew that at this point charles was missing and they really needed to organize a true search party to try to find him. But pew, pew, pew. they would have to do that the next no morning when they gang. had light again. How long so ago was this? This is back when they had film cameras. So this is pretty old. So I don't know. Was bear spray a thing back then? Ranger called out a few more times for Charles. And after not hearing anything, he reluctantly turned around and made his way back to his truck and drove back to the ranger station the 80s? where he would okay. tell Glenda that he could not find her husband and they would now have to wait for sunrise. At sunrise the next morning, 20 searchers arrived at the trailhead where Charles and Glenda had been, and these searchers had dogs, and all the dogs had Charles's scent from some clothes that was in Glenda's car. And so this big search team very slowly and methodically began moving down this trail. And so they went across the abandoned road, over the train tracks, through the meadow with the white flowers, they got to the steep section of the trail and they got all the way up to that point where Charles and Glenda had separated and Charles had it gone uphill to do whatever boy. he was going Bummy to do. Man. And it was at that point on the steep section that one of the searcher's dogs picked up Charles's scent and took off running uphill. 
and the searcher, whose dog this was, took off running after the dog, and the dog, it went up for a little while, up the steep rocky outcropping, and then it turned and began going down again until it reached a different meadow, so not the same one they walked through with the white flowers. This was farther away to the right, and in this meadow, the dog, who still very much had the scent, began to slow down, and it went straight for this tree that was kind of a standalone tree right at the base of this steep section, and this tree had low hanging branches, maybe five feet off the ground, and the dog went right up to the tree, and then it stopped for a second, and the searcher by this point had caught up to the dog, and so he's looking at this tree, and he sees the ground looks really disturbed, and there's deep gouges in this tree, and then it's the dog bear. went around this tree and sprinted another 50 feet or so, and then stopped like it had found something. And when the searcher caught up to his dog, he looked down and he found what they feared the most. It was Charles and he was deceased. His body was totally mangled. His arms and legs were eaten away. There were deep cuts and gouges all over his body. And there was a blood trail from Charles all the way back I to this it. tree. Also, just a few feet from Charles's outstretched hand was a camera, Charles's camera. Now, it was obvious that something horrific had happened to Charles, and there were clear signs of a struggle that took place near this tree, and then also over up, here up, where up. he was found, there were clear marks on the ground that there was some sort of fight that happened right here. But interestingly, Charles was carrying a gun, but it appeared that he did not unholster it and he didn't fire it. Instead, it almost looked like whatever was happening to Charles, he refused to put his camera down, which is why it was so close to his hand when he finally died. And so... Dude, what a badass. The dude's getting mauled by a bear. Dude, this would be a great picture right now. Like, literally getting mauled to death. Oh! Oh, God! Hey, wait, hold still. Smile. Oh, okay. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, J All right. Right there, that's a good one. The fuck? So it was decided that the only way to determine what happened to Charles would be to develop his camera, to figure out what he was taking pictures of before he died. The grind. And so authorities would send off Charles's camera He did it for developed. the grind. <laughs> and two weeks later, when they got it back, they couldn't believe what they saw. The photos very clearly told the story of what happened to Charles. This is what happened after Charles left his wife on that trail. When Charles stopped his wife and signaled to her that he wanted to take one more picture up the trail, he had found a photographic opportunity of a lifetime. The warm spring weather that had drawn Charles and Glenda out of their house to Glacier National Park had also woken the grizzly bears in the park from their Aha! hibernation. And what Charles had seen up the trail was a mother grizzly bear and her three cubs. The first few photographs that Charles would take- Oh, that's why. Oh no. Oh no. Not a mama bear with her cubs. Oh no. Pig is right for once. I'm always right. Take of these bears were shot from a good distance away, and it just showed the mother bear and her three babies just kind of sauntering around the rocks, not really paying any attention to Charles. To Charles, grizzly bears were the most majestic creatures in nature. He didn't just love them, he viewed them as if they were sort of magical in some way. He was always going to local town meetings to speak about grizzly bears' beauty, and we needed to defend their natural habitat. As such, anyone who knew Charles knew about his passion for grizzlies. And while of course Charles knew that grizzly bears were- Dude, it's always people who have a passion for grizzlies that die horribly. Dangerous, he also thought that the bears, who were very smart and sensitive, could sense his own very gentle and protective feelings towards them, and so if he was around them, they would never perceive him as a threat. Charles had taken some very good photos of other bears, black bears, but he had never taken what he called the definitive grizzly bear photo. And it was going to be this definitive grizzly photo of the mother and her three cubs that would finally get him a spot in the Hungry Horse News publication. As Charles took more and more photos of these bears, you could see in the photos that Charles was getting closer and closer and closer to this oh, mother bear no. and her cubs. It was obvious that he was tracking them, even as the mother bear and the cubs were clearly trying to walk away from him. 
Finally, oh, when Charles no, got about 50 idiot. feet away from this family of grizzly bears, he must have kicked a rock or stepped on a twig that broke that startled the bears. And so the second to last photo that Charles would take of this family shows the mother bear very clearly turning around to look at Charles. And she's making perfect eye contact with him, oh, as is one of her cubs. Charles would take one more photo. And in this photo, you can see the bears are not just staring at Charles, they are running towards him. They are charging him. And it was likely after taking this photo that Charles realized the danger he was in. At this point, Charles wow. tried to make a run for it by running down the side of this mountain. He got down to that tree with the low hanging limbs and he attempted to climb up into it, maybe hoping he could get one more picture of this bear if they would just leave him alone. But the mother bear and her cubs, they came charging down. They saw him up in the tree and the mother bear began climbing into the tree and she reached Charles. Now, she likely wow. weighed about 400 pounds, and when mother grizzly bears are defending their young, they are absolutely merciless. And so she must have grabbed him or bit onto him and yanked him from the tree. And Charles, somehow, after being pulled to the ground and getting slashed and bit by this bear, he managed to break away from her, as we can tell from the blood trail, and he made it about 50 feet away from this tree before the bear chased him down again, jumped on top of uh. him, and killed him. When authorities figured out that Charles had managed uh. to briefly get away from this mother grizzly bear and made it 50 feet away from her, they wondered why he hadn't pulled out his gun and shot at the bears to defend himself. But Charles's wife, Glenda, said it made perfect sense that Charles had not tried to harm this grizzly bear or her cubs. He loved grizzly bears, and he would never dream of leaving these three cubs without their mother. After Charles's death, Poor the guy. Rangers did not attempt to track down this bear and her cubs and do anything. Dude, someone who's obsessed with grizzly bears, you think they would know a little bit more about how you need to keep the fuck away from a mama bear? thing to the bears. I don't know anything about grizzly bears, but that, that's common sense. Because they felt like the bears were just acting like bears. Yeah, true. He could have done a warning Charles shot. Who was in the wrong. And Charles's family I and made it worse, though. would say that is a decision that Charles would definitely support. Charles's photos of the grizzly bear family were published in the Hungry Horse News alongside an article about his death. So, you know, I, I don't I don't get why 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 do people push man it's called boundaries it's called boundaries okay to be fair like that that's pretty badass the fact that he's like no dude I'm going out I don't give a fuck I ain't killing this bear they can just take me now it's time to walk away I hope you enjoyed your stay did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribed? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.